the first topic I'm going to cover is about language in general. Okay, so I guess we all speak the language, and language is what we use to communicate with each other, and you want to make each other understood what's in your mind. So language to me is actually secondary to your thought, because language is to say what's in your mind, but not all the times language can do the job, right? So a lot of time you have to say, that's what I said, but that's not what I meant. Or, I mean much more than what I said. From these expressions, what can you tell? You can see that there's a big gap between what you want to express and what you actually utter, right? Same thing with giving a class. I may have so much in my mind that I want to share with you, but whatever I come out, maybe only half of what I had in my mind. But again, out of the half that I have come out, probably you have only received another half of what I have said. So it turns out that it would not be a perfect match, usually, between what you think and what you say. So make sure that you understand that nature, that very nature of language. Language is one of the best ways to present what you have up here. However, that format is usually not a perfect way. Nobody can say what's really in your mind because it's usually more complicated. Because in language, the form itself does not carry out or does not transmit everything that you wish to convey. There's a lot more behind. And what would be the, lot, uh, what would be the extra things behind? For example, your background knowledge, right? Everybody comes from different country, grew, grow, uh, you grew up speaking different languages, and you have encountered different people. You have different world experiences. Okay, some of you have been exchange student for the first time. Some of you have been exchange for the end time, right? Some of you have been to men in China, as far as I could tell. Uh, so you have different experiences. So the same vocabulary the same lexical item or the same vocabulary item may mean different things in different places and also because of your different past experience you might have different interpretation toward the same item. So look at this. Uh, when, when if one of the most important thing about language is communication then this cartoon say, says so much about the importance of learning another language, right? Uh, look at the subtitle here. How to motivate your kid to learn a second language. I don't know what's your motivation to learn a second language because you are now normal kids, right? You are adult and you are willing to learn another language or to explore the culture of other, uh, belonging to another language, but I don't know your, la your motivation. When you grow up, the motivation may be a little bit more complicated. But for a child, the motivation could be very simple. Uh, by the way, I think this is uh, not necessarily the, mo the best motivation for me to motivate my child to learn a second language. For example, uh, the way I motivate my child to learn English was when he was a child. I took him to the state, and he likes to go to McDonald's, right? So I said, if you want to eat that, and you want us to put up with that food and eat it with you, the only possibility is you go there and order your meal yourself, okay? So you try very hard memorizing everything, you know? When you learn the language, usually you memorize them by chunks, right? Okay, so he was able to order uh, his hamburger, so we put up with the meal and we ate with him. And then we said, okay, we want to increase his vocabulary, right? So we told him, we said, look, you know, those people are refilling the coffee for people, you know, in the restaurant. So if you want to have more french fries, go there and tell, tell the girl you want to have your french fry refilled. 
Okay, so he learned the vocabulary and he went there. And of course, he was lucky because he was only four. He was only four years old, and perhaps people think he was cute. So he got his first refill of <laughs> French fry the first time. So I think you know, uh, the best way to motivate a person to learn a second language is to know what that person wants, right? And you give them what he wants or what she wants, then usually you can, you know, you, you can get your purpose achieved. And my child probably, um, or my son, probably he's not the best English speaking speakers, but he's not afraid to speak English. I think because of that experience, okay? He thinks that's one of the tools for him to get what he wants. Okay. So language is, a in, is also, other than communication, you want to use it as an instrument for social interaction between human beings, of course. Use with the primary aims of establishing communicative relations between speakers and addressees. Okay, so we don't just use language to get what we want. We also have other needs because you're human beings. So language is to play that role of being an instrument for your social, social interaction. So you use language not just to get the essentials in life, but you also want to get uh, what you need mentally as a human being. And usually, if you are a human being, I think social interaction is unavoidable. So language also plays that function. Uh, what kind of language do you usually use for your social interactions? You use chit chat, you use small talk, what else? When you console other people, if people feel sad or down, you talk to them. But that's, do you think that's, uh, that's the same as what we talked about in the beginning, just to make other people understood? Because it's more than just being understood. It's something that you want to go beyond you know, the basic need, uh, the basic function of language. So look at this cartoon. Sometimes you say Happy New Year, and then even a simple form like Happy New Year could be interpreted many different ways. Could be making a prediction, okay, or expression a wish, or attempting politeness. So you see, everything you say could be interpreted more than one way. Depending on the context you have at the time, and depending on your mutual understanding with the addressee, sometimes you can say so little words, but you are understood because that person knows you very well. Some, sometimes you have say a lot of things, you are still not being understood because you don't have the mutual understanding there. So even a simple form, it could carry out different functions or this, it could have different meanings. So form and meaning is not just a one-to-one -one correspondence. You know, the relationship could be quite complicated, maybe more complicated than you have thought about. So the same thing, if you said, uh, for example, if you want somebody to clean up the room, you have many ways to make your request or command or hint, right? You can say, the room looks messy. And then you keep on looking at the girl or the boy and say, the, the room looks messy. What do you want to do? You want the person to get up and do things, right? So instead of saying the room needs, needs to be cleaned up, you can just say the room looks messy or say, don't you think we need a little bit exercise uh, to make the room look better? So you have different form to achieve the same function or you have a simple form, a single form to achieve different function. That's usually uh, the <clears throat> relationship between form and meaning. It's one to many or many to one, okay, never one to one. And so what is language? I think this is a nice chart. Uh, it says language is more than just communication. We first talk about communication. You say it is the primary method by which we do things together. 
So language has more functions than just being uh, understood by each other or just for social interaction. We can do things together. That's what we talk about just now when I said uh, the room needs clean up or it looks a little bit messy. Actually, I am performing an act with my language, right? So for example, if I say, uh, I'll see you tomorrow at 4, what am I doing? I'm making a promise, right? I'm making a promise. Uh, instead of doing it, I'm using my language to do what I want to do. I'm uh, carrying out an act of promising. Or when you go to a wedding, the priest say, I now pronounce you man and wife. He's also performing an act, right? He is making your marriage valid. Because not everybody said that word can make that marriage become valid. Only the priest or only somebody with that power. So sometimes you can do things with your words, not just by saying it. It also has to be said by the right person in the right occasion. Okay? So with language, you have to take into account What's the con what the contextual situation is in order to make that valid. So language is the accumulation of shared meaning of common ground. That's what we talk about. You may have a lot of shared experiences, so you may not need a lot of words. So you see all this relationship you know, from A to B, from the speaker to hearer. So communication can be one way communication is just to send the message out. To me, I would not like to call this communication because one way is never a communication. To me, a communication has to go both ways. So for example, I don't know if I'm communicating with you now because if I look at you and you look back with blank eyes or motionless face, I do not know if my message is getting across. That to me is not communication. So I don't like to call a one-way communication. I hope the communication in this classroom will always be both ways. Okay? So I need feedback. I need feedback in order to make sure that uh, I know my message is getting across. Uh, the second one is conversation. So conversation involves at least two parties. So it's a two-way communication. Both sides feel understood. Okay. So to me, this is communication. Okay, because uh, you know, if you say something and you are not being understood, that would not be com communication. Then you also can use language to collaborate. You are thinking, planning, making decision. Don't you do that? Sometimes when you think, you have to say things to yourself because you are using the language to think and to process. Uh, if you are, usually it happens to older people, sometimes you can think, plan, or make decision by talking with others because you are what I call plugging other people's brains, right? Because when you talk to other people, you know what's in that, peop in that person's head and you're getting ideas out of his brains. So usually by talking with other people, you can get things done better. This is the same way with this class. I do hope with that discussion class, you will be able to participate actively in the participation because you're plugging, you're picking other people's head, picking other people's brain. You're getting ideas out of other people's brain. And you can, do, you can accomplish more by doing less, so to speak. So discussion is usually one of the best way when you want to do research paper or when you want to get things done in a better way. Make sure that you talk to other people and get enough ad advice. You can also call, create something by using language. Right? You can join activity, making, what, what is that? or doing, look at this, you can do things together by using language as well. So language has many, many functions. It's not just for social interactions, not just for communication. It's also for you to uh, 
collaborate with others and to create things together with other people. Okay. So when we talk about language, we usually think about spoken form or written form. We tend to forget that in communication, there's also the major part of the nonverbal communication. So by, you know, uh, nonverbal communication. I'm supposed to cover this up first because I wanted to ask you uh, how many, what's the percentage that you think we have done communication with the actual words? The percentage, according to this study at UCLA, this, this is a pretty recent study, but as early as in 1958, there was a Professor Hall, H-U-L-L. -L. He had done a, a study with a similar result. Actually, what we communicate with words is only 7% of all the communication we do every day. 93% of communication effectiveness is determined by your nonverbal cues. Okay, so is that number alarming, surprising? Does it, uh, this is pretty much the percentage you have been thinking? Do you think nonverbal plays such an important role in your communication? Yeah. So uh, one of the most effective nonverbal communication in a classroom is the way you are there. If I come in, seeing a bunch of people sleepy, that's your nonverbal communication to me, right? And there are many things, and if you look at me and smile back to me, that's also a kind of uh, nonverbal communication. So it's mutual. You know, if I come in here as spiritless, then probably you don't even want to take the class, right? Okay. So another study indicated that impact of the performance was determined seven percent by the word used, thirty-eight percent by your voice quality. Okay, I must have failed this 38%, okay. And 55% by your nonverbal communication. So the nonverbal parts, uh, they have uh, done a uh, breakdown. So 55% is by your nonverbal communication. So you might want to ask yourself, what are the 55%? What are the sub-category uh, of that? Uh, so in other words, if you talk about words, written or speaking as the linguistic part of the communication. And the nonverbal communication refer to anything that is not related to the voice or language or the written form. You still have a part called paralinguistic cues for communication. Those probably will fall under the 38%. For example, have you thought about silence as being a way of communication? I hope I could make you uh, <coughs> agree that silence is also a way of communication. So let's first look at uh, the channels of nonverbal communication. Uh, the most obvious one would be facial expression. Or uh, the, the clues in our voices, those are two categories, the, the, the paralanguage, I will talk about that later your hand gestures, your body movement, which is also called kinesics, okay? The study of, of body movement is called kinesics. Or touch, haptics, okay? That's the proper name for that. Or personal space, how far apart you want to stand or sit next to a person, okay? I saw that, okay? So what does that mean? You don't like him? <laughs> okay. So personal space is also a kind of nonverbal communication. Uh, since we have people from so many different cultures, I'm kind of interested to find out some of the features that I have uh, put down here. Uh, what culture do you think have very rich hand gestures when you communicate with each other? Italian, Italian for sure, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and what else? How about Spanish? Do we have any Spanish speaker here? Yeah? How about Spanish? Do you have a lot of hand gestures? Yes. Could you 
share with us one or two of the gestures that you can think of. What is this? Uh, I just know that I, I talk a lot with my hands. Okay. Look at her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Do it again. That's okay. It's so common to you, but it may be foreign and difficult to a lot of people who are not familiar with your culture. So would you mind standing up and do it again? <laughs> do it. What does it mean? You don't know what it means. Oh, the meaning is I don't know. If you really want to make something like emphasize something, it's really cool. It's not just the head, it's also her facial expression. Did you see that? Thank you. Okay, that's what I want to get. Okay. You also do the same. Okay, so what's, what does that mean? It just means that you're talking. It's pretty iconic, right? It's like you have words coming in and out, you know, like a flow, like the flow of communication. I don't know if this gesture is common to you. Yes. What is that? You have seen that, right? I don't know. Okay, so you see, you probably come from a Spanish background that is Mexico. Mexico, okay. I happen to live in Puerto Rico for many years. They also speak Spanish. But they have all kinds of nonverbal different from the ones in Mexico and probably richer than in Mexico. This is pickpocketing. You are referring to somebody who pickpocket. Like this. And I didn't know. And they will use a lot of their facial expression as well. That's very interesting. You want to share with us uh, something about Italian? Italian? You're not Italian, okay. But you have seen people using it. Yeah. Oh, probably you have seen uh, the movies. So Mussolini, back uh, in World War II, mm. when he was giving speeches, he was always just speaking. Oh, okay. So now that you have uh, YouTube, so convenient, go, go back and search on your uh, computer. You, you, you just look at... Turn, turn off the sound. Just look at the person, the speaker, and just look at the nonverbal part to see if that is true. Okay, so you may find it interesting, very interesting. Also, the personal space. What's the comfortable personal space for American people? We have many people from the United States, right? Okay. <laughs> what is that? We were, um, we were joking because we were going closer than the normal personal space. Too close. Yeah. You don't but feel I, comfortable. Well, normally, no, no, but that's just such a good Don't Americans, maybe, like what, 12 inches? No. I think it's about 12 inches. How much? No. 12, 12 inches. No, it would be more like 18, I guess. Very good. That's exactly the number, 18. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, 18 inches. What about Hispanic? Again, okay. much closer, right? Much closer. And we have, we have a student here who grew up in the States, but you are not from, you grew up in Chinese family? No, you? Yeah. How do you feel about personal space? 18 inch is the limit you can put up with. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, touching. Kissing on the cheeks. That's considered kind of touching, right? What's your stereotype impression about kissing on the cheeks for the French people? Do we have any French speakers here? Oh, who grew up in the French culture? It's just very natural for people to do that. 
Yeah, I, I know in the States, you also kiss on the cheeks sometimes, right? But the, no, you don't? Which part of the States are you from? West? West, okay. Uh, so you don't kiss on the cheeks unless you are good friends. Not even that. Oh. Only family. Only family. Yeah, like Oh, good. Okay, that's eye-opening to me. Uh, what about French? That, since you know a little bit about French, they do it to friends, right? Yeah, it's just, just about it. I mean, it's, I'd say it's a lot less common between males, but... <laughs> okay, less common um, between yeah. males, okay. Uh, like with everyone else, it's just natural reading. And it's also interesting because the number of times you do it to switches between locations. So like, Southern France, or at least where I was, they would do three. Three times, right? Like, I think Paris is supposed to be two, and then like, it might be less France, so it's one. Yeah, that was the question I was going to ask. One cheek, two cheeks, or three times? Okay, so it depending on the region, right? Okay, so you see, all these kind of things are not written. Nobody would teach you how to do it properly. But if you want to be in that culture and you want to blend in, you have to know those tacit codes, right? Those tacit codes. And those are the kind of things most difficult or very difficult to learn when you want to master another language. Okay. So nonverbal communication in a multicultural setting will be even more complicated. So research shows that clues in the nonverbal channels of communication those channels we have just mentioned. That is how something is said, not necessarily said, but expressed, are often more important than words alone, what is said. So how includes other ways, all those nonverbal things. So probably if your language proficiency is not that good, you can always compensate it by your nonverbal. Because remember, 93% of your communication it's not done by words, right? Okay, so multicultural differences in body language, facial expression, use of space, and especially gestures are enormous and enormously open to misinterpretation, okay? Uh, you know, when I grew up in Taiwan, okay, at least 30 years ago, okay? I don't want to give you more, 30 years ago, uh, it's very common for two girls, especially high school, junior high school girls. They will walk hand in hand. Going to school, going shopping on the street, they will just go out hand in hand. Is it common nowadays? Do you do that? Do you allow people to do that in the United States? What's your interpretation of two girls walking hand in hand all the time? Okay. I've seen your nonverbals. I know what I know you, you know what I what I'm trying to say. Okay, so different time, different setting, different culture. They may have different meaning. So these are the parts that you should become very sensitive to. Uh, so in the following I'll just uh, show with you some of the examples, some of the samples that I have taken from the website the proximic rules, the distance that we have just talked about. They are unwritten and never taught. What would, for example, I'll give you a situation. What would a woman react when her personal space is invaded by other people? Okay, so you can ask this kind of question in order to understand your own culture a little bit better. Will you ask them to sit somewhere else? Or would you just stare at the space invaders defiantly, but you will not move? Or will you leave, say nothing to the people who invaded your personal space? So you can ask yourself questions like this. And there are a lot of information on the website if you want to know more about this kind of things. And I, we should have Japanese students here, right? Because I really need your help. I don't know. I, I, I think I failed the test. Okay, can you guess the meaning of these Japanese gestures? Does it mean I'm scared like a bunny? Or I have been hearing things about you? Or I'm angry? What is it? 
Oh, this is angry. Okay. Does it make sense to you for those of you who don't speak Japanese? Well, you pick C. I thought it was A. <laughs> I thought it was A. What would be the Chinese uh, gesture for a bunny? This is the Chinese gesture for a bunny, right? Oh, what is it? You do this? No. <laughs> for bunny? Chester, what's the Chinese gesture for bunny? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, see? Okay, so he's from the same culture I'm from. Okay. All right. So these are the sources where this is taken from. And th there's an interesting article there by Susan Heathfield. So listen with your eyes because, you know, verbal, nonverbal communication you have to watch. So we would end this session here.